Isaac Asimov is one of the world's most influential and well-known sci-fi authors. He had a love of science and science fiction that started when he was nine years old. After being influenced by pulp and science fiction magazines, he started writing when he was 11. When he was 16, his father bought him a typewriter, which he used constantly. When he was 17, he considered writing professionally and worked on his first story, Cosmic Corkscrew. After finishing it about a year later, he submitted it to the magazine Astounding Science Fiction, where it was rejected. His second story was also rejected, but the rejection letter was supportive, which encouraged him to keep writing. His third story, Marooned Off Vesta, was bought by Amazing Stories and it appeared in the March 1939 issue. After that, his stories were regularly sold to various publications. In a little over two years, he had written 22 stories, and 13 of those ended up being published. Asimov was just 21 years old when he wrote Nightfall, which was published in Astounding Science Fiction in September 1941. Decades later, in 1968, the Science Fiction Writers of America voted Nightfall the best science fiction short story ever written. In 1979, Julie Corman, the wife of Roger Corman, was reading a review of an Asimov anthology, which included his short story Nightfall. The review mentioned this and how it was named the best sci-fi short story of all time. This piqued her interest, so she picked up the anthology to read the story. Nightfall is about a planet that is constantly illuminated by at least one of its six suns. The planet has areas of darkness and shadows, caves, and tunnels, but night does not exist. A journalist interviews scientists who have discovered evidence of numerous ancient civilizations on the planet, all destroyed by fire, with each collapse occurring roughly every 2,000 years. At the same time, a doomsday cult has been formed around ancient tomes that say the planet periodically passes through an enormous cave where stars appear which rain down fire from the heavens and rob people of their souls. After reading it, she loved the moral dilemmas within the story and wanted to purchase the rights to have it made into a film. Julie had produced numerous films for New World Pictures, like Night Call Nurses and The Student Teachers, but really wanted to produce a sci-fi film. She thought, what better a sci-fi film to do than one based on the best sci-fi short of all time? She contacted Asimov's representative and bought the rights for an undisclosed sum. Julie Corman wanted Asimov to write the screenplay for the film and set up a meeting with him to discuss this. They met in his office, and after asking him to write the screenplay, he pointed to his desk. On his desk were numerous stacks of papers. He said he was working on 12 projects now and didn't have time to take on another. Also, he said he wrote the story when he was very young, and now that he was in his 60s, he had long since moved on. He wished her the best with the project, and now Julie had to find someone to write the screenplay. She approached Paul Meyersberg, who wrote the screenplay for Nicholas Rogue's The Man Who Fell to Earth, which was based on the novel by Walter Tevis. Rogue was previously the cinematographer for Roger Corman on The Mask of Red Death in 1964. Meyersberg passed on the project, so Corman began to look elsewhere. Interest in the movie was fairly high, so Roger Corman announced the movie was being made as a co-production with a German company, for somewhere in the neighborhood of $6 million. They went through a variety of writers, but none of them were able to produce what they were looking for. Julie said with every writer, they were all missing the essence of Nightfall. She said some scripts had excellent sci-fi elements, but weren't very visual. In others, the characters were good, but the philosophical war of words was played down. After a while, the German company pulled out and the project was shelved. In 1986, Meyersberg released Captive, which he wrote and directed. Julie saw the movie and was impressed, so she contacted Meyersberg to see if now he'd be interested in writing Nightfall. Meyersberg was interested on one condition, that he write and direct. They agreed, and in June of 1987, Meyersberg spent five weeks writing the script. Meyersberg completely overhauled the short story. Instead of the planet having six suns, it now had three. In the short story, the characters had numbers after their first names like Aton 77 which was dropped, so the characters now just went by their first names. Speaking of dropping, he got rid of all the characters except for two, Aton and Sor. He then created new characters to fill in the blanks of his script. The story was now about Aton, the leader of the city, and Sor, a blind prophet. Sor isn't blind in the short story. Some of the new characters were Roa, Aton's wife, who left him to join Sor's cult, and Anna, 
a nomad seductress who seduced and distracted Aton from his leadership duties. Aton and Sor represent the relationship between science and religion. Mayersburg saw the movie as a way for him to make a sci-fi film that blurred the past and present together. The director liked Asimov's work, but felt many of his stories couldn't work as films. He said the scale of most of them was far too large and wouldn't translate to film. His belief was that film is not a very good medium for sci-fi. He said sci-fi is visual and therefore not very imaginative. Film can only show you what exists that which we can already see with our eyes. If you want to imagine a city in space, you have to build a model. And frankly, it looks like a model. He felt Nightfall would be able to avoid these problems by focusing on the basics. Since at its core it was a dramatic story, he wanted to focus the film around that. Mayersburg said Nightfall was a very famous story, but not necessarily a good one. He said, it doesn't have much plot. What it does have is a situation. It's a very basic story about how humans are naturally rational, but often have this pull towards the spiritual. It's the war within us all, the war between God and science. Either we deny God and embrace science, or accept God and reject the rational. He wanted the film to be a state of mind, not a sequence of events. He wanted to present the film as an approach to a life crisis. How would an individual handle this? What would they do? Some embrace science while others embrace religion. He also thought that since we as humans aren't all that afraid of the darkness, it would be silly to see them all losing their minds at the end. He had to show something that was frightening to the characters in the film, but not scary to most people. He said, when you're watching grown men and women hysterical about night falling, you tend to say, oh, come on now, what's the big deal? The whole thing doesn't work on a visual medium. When casting, they chose actors who the director thought were interesting rather than conventional. For the main character of Aton, they chose David Burney. Burney was mainly a TV actor in shows like The Love Boat and Serpico. For the cult leader Soar, they hired Alexis Kanner. The director said he wanted someone who could play the character charismatic, quixotic, on the brink of being a charlatan. For Anton's ex Roa, they hired Sarah Douglas. Douglas had just ended her run on the TV series Falcon Crest but most know her from her role as Ursa in Superman 1 and 2. Anna was played by Andra Milian. She was just in the TV series The Paper Chase before this. Bette was played by Star Andreef. She was in Ghoulies 2 and also was in Falcon Crest. Filming was set to run for five weeks. Julie Corman had worked as a location scout, and she was well aware of an architectural development in the Arizona desert called Arcasante. The location was built during the end of World War II by an Italian architect, Paolo Soleri, who was the pupil of Frank Lloyd Wright. The look of the location was unique, and they felt it would work for what they were trying to accomplish. Arcasante was an open commune where about 50 people lived and worked. They needed to have the full run of the location, so they paid some of the locals not to work during filming so they wouldn't interfere with the production. A few of them were even hired on as extras. The director wanted this location because the concept for his film was extremely low-tech. This wasn't going to be a sci-fi film like Star Wars. They now had a much smaller budget than before, somewhere well below $2 million. They also planned to film in Cosante, which was just outside of Scottsdale, Arizona, about 90 miles away. Cosante was another site designed by Soleri, in a similar style to Arcasante. They began filming and ran into a completely unforeseen problem. It rained. Not just rain, but consistent rain. It rained for three of the five weeks of shooting, so they had to get creative. This was a movie where the sun was supposed to be shining 24-7, and now it was dark. On top of that, the rain created mud everywhere. On the times when it was sunny, they had to angle the cameras so the audience wouldn't see the characters trudging through the mud. Another addition from the director was Soar telling his cult that only the blind could see. They performed a ritual where birds of prey pecked out Roa's eyes so she could be a blind prophet like Soar. They convinced the actress, Sarah Douglas, to go along with this. They placed her in this contraption, covered her eyes, and placed meat in the slots where the birds could eat. She said it was foolish of her, and she's not sure how close she was to having her eyes pecked out. Aside from the constant rain, the production went along without any other major problems. The end of Asimov's short story was bleak. It ended with essentially everyone on the planet going mad once the final sun had set. Mayersberg wanted the film to be more optimistic. His thought was, 
Once the long night returned, the stars come out and it begins to snow. This is a new world that had been open to these people, and they realize it's not the end. Now, some of them do go mad, but overall, most people remain sane and quite positive with what was coming in the time ahead. The director knew with a film called Nightfall, if they didn't deal with what happened when Nightfall did come, the audience would feel cheated. While the short story could end with, The Long Night Had Come Again, with the movie, they would need some sort of epilogue to show what was happening with The Long Night. Mayersburg said he was incredibly faithful to Asimov. He was a fan of the author's work and said some of his inclusions were elements from his other writings. He said he thinks when Asimov sees Nightfall, the author would be pleased with its content, if not rather surprised by its form. The movie was released in April of 1988 and was distributed by Roger Corman's Concord Pictures. Julie Corman said the movie had a good reception at the time and did okay, although a review from the LA Times said it was a classic Asimov tale gone bad. Asimov eventually saw the film and wasn't happy with how it turned out. Corman said she wished that they were able to get a larger budget for the film, because that was its biggest hurdle. It's a film that most likely would have worked with more money, but as it was, they did the best they could within the limitations. She said this is a film that she would love to see get a big budget remake. She also said Mayersburg was not as experienced as they had hoped, which may have led to the film being somewhat underwhelming. Audiences didn't seem to like the changes that were made to Asimov's story, and it's generally disliked. Mayersburg directed one more film after this, The Last Samurai, in 1990. Also in 1990, perhaps spawned from how poorly the movie turned out, Asimov worked with author Robert Silverberg and adapted the short story into a full novel. In 2000, Nightfall was remade by Roger Corman's new Concord Pictures. This version is apparently even further removed from the original story, with sword fights and giant CG snakes. Although it does have David Carradine, so I'm trying to track it down out of curiosity. Nightfall is an interesting movie. I've read the Asimov short, and I recognize just how far removed from that it is. I do think the original short story is fantastic, and they should have stuck closer to that. However, judging the movie on its own merits, separated from the source material, I was really surprised at how much I enjoyed it. When I was younger, I saw it and was bored because I thought there were going to be monsters when the sun went down. Now that I'm watching it with an older set of eyes, I'm seeing it as what the director intended. It's a tale of science versus religion. It's also an interesting mix of family, betrayal, and obsession. It was confusing and some might say pretentious, to which I can understand. It does expect the viewer to be able to follow this, even though it doesn't fully explain what's going on. I don't know, it made sense to me, but I've seen it about five times now. The editing was weird at times, but nowhere near as bad as the last Resident Evil movie. The acting was good, and even though I knew where it was going, it kept me engaged. I also liked the look of the film. This cinematographer was Darius Wolski, who went on to shoot the Pirates of the Caribbean series, The Crow, The Martian, and lots of other well-known movies. He was just recently nominated for an Oscar for his work on News of the World. Douglas doesn't hate it, but she's not very fond of it. She says she's certainly done worse films. I can see why fans of Asimov's story wouldn't like this. That's understandable. I do think it's frustrating to see something remove itself so far from the source. Still, as much as I thought I was going to want to goof on this, I kept thinking about it and really liked it overall. I opted to do this as an exploring episode rather than just a GBF. Again, the short story is light years better, but this was an interesting take on the material, and I think Mayersburg's intentions were good, but his execution was off. I don't agree with the director at all in terms of this not being a very good short story, or his take on sci-fi not working in film, especially when some of the best films ever made are sci-fi. I think it's hilarious that the director thought people weren't afraid of the dark. Isn't that one of the biggest, most common fears? Why was it so outlandish to think that a planet filled with people who have never known night wouldn't be afraid of absolute darkness? I also agree with Julie Corman. I think this story deserves a bigger budgeted remake. In general, I dislike remakes because they usually take the same movie and do it over again with a new coat of paint. In cases like this, I think it's an opportunity for them to tell the story closer to the original source material or how about taking a stab at the novel? It wouldn't even have to be a $100 million film. I think they could easily do it within the $10 to $20 million range. So Hollywood, 
Instead of remaking Invasion of the Body Snatchers for the bazillionth time, why not take a look at remaking the greatest science fiction story of all time? Nothing important has yet been said or even understood. <laughs> 